Yeah, that's us. We are crying out to the Lord in desperation. We need him. We know we do. We're going to be talking about crying out to the Lord, praying to the Lord in the message today. But while we're still on our feet, would you bow with me together? Let's pray together. My Father, that song we just sang expresses our earnest desire that you hear us from heaven when we pray to you. And Father, we know that you do hear us when we pray with the right heart and in a right relationship with you. And we thank you, Father, for hearing us when we pray. And we want uh, to hear from you now as you speak to us through the Bible. And as we uh, return this morning to what Jesus teaches us about prayer. And Father, we pray that uh, we'll not only hear, but we will obey. We'll respond to your truth with right hearts and commitment to follow what you teach us um, in how we live each day. We ask it now in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Well, it's been an eventful past week. Um, we've had, um, well, a few, Margie and Goff's grandson, Keith Goff's son, passed away, and they want to thank our church for uh, expressions of love and support in that uh, tragic event that occurred last Monday morning. Uh, we also, you may know David Wilson, who's been a part of our church for a long time, uh, worked in the um, usher ministry a good bit. Uh, he passed away, and uh, we'll be having his funeral this uh, Thursday at 3 o'clock here at the church. A lot of things been happening. I also want to personally thank uh, you if you were among those who were able to turn out for our prayer rally for our nation this past Wednesday evening. We had a great uh, turnout for that and we spent some time in prayer for our country and uh, I trust that you will be praying with the rest of us uh, earnestly over the next couple of weeks leading up to the election as we pray for God's will to be done in our nation. Well. Um, I want to invite you to take your Bible, and um, it's one of those sermons that's kind of hard to tell you exactly where to turn, but uh, because we'll be in a lot of places in Scripture today, but Matthew chapter 9 might be a good place to turn, or pardon me, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 might be a good place for you to find right now. Last week, we began looking at Jesus' teachings on prayer in Matthew 6, particularly at the Lord's Prayer that Christians have cherished for 2,000 years. Uh, you know, Jesus' disciples said to him one day, Lord, teach us to pray. And uh, the Lord responded to that by saying in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, this then is how you should pray. And he gave them a model prayer. There are several things that I'm sure you, along with the rest of us, include in your prayers. Um, we all, I'm sure, thank God for his goodness to us. We praise God, I hope we all do at some point in our praying. We ask God to meet our needs. We put our requests out before him. Uh, we confess our sins. And um, this morning, as we move deeper into the Lord's Prayer, a new question comes up. Does the order of those parts of prayer matter? What we pray first and second and third and so forth. Does it matter what order we pray those things when we pray? Now, we need to be careful when we study the Lord's Prayer not to become too rigid in how we apply it. Remember, it is just an example. It's not uh, the kind of prayer that... Um, Jesus talked about last week with the pagans, you know, he said it's not something that we're to memorize and say, well, God, um, uh, our Father who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And it's not, Jesus said that that's the way not to pray. But let me just give you a general guideline, Jesus said, on what ought to be included when you pray. And... Um, but that being true, I, I will go on to say that for reasons I'm going to explain this morning, I think the part of our prayer where the timing, where it falls in our praying matters most is what we say first, what we say first to God. 
As we pointed out last week, Christ intended the Lord's Prayer to be a go-by. Like we said, not a prayer to be repeated verbatim to God, but is there a right and best way to begin our prayers? I think there is, and I think it's suggested and recommended by Christ here in the Lord's Prayer. Just how did um, Jesus begin the Lord's Prayer? Well, he started out, Matthew 6, verse 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And as we saw last week, those first couple of words, Our Father answers the question for us, who we're praying to? We pray to the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit also are involved in our praying, but it's the Father that we're praying to, our Father in heaven. That's how we start out our praying. Now, Jesus helped us with that. And then after our Father, what did Jesus say in that, that uh, ninth verse of Matthew 6? He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does that mean? That's not language that you and I probably use every day nowadays. Well, hallowed means to be revered as holy, means to be regarded as sacred, treated as sacred, respected as sacred, holy. A person's name, you know, is their reputation. And God wants his name to be respected for what his name says about him, that he is the holy God of heaven. He wants us to think about that when we think of his name. And um, he wants people to revere him that way. One writer explains it this way. He says, when Jesus petitions or asks God to hallow his name, he is asking that God act in such a way that he visibly demonstrates his holiness and his glory. And here's where I'm going with this this morning. I'm just going to give you the bottom line right here up front. I'm convinced that every time you and I pray, we are to begin our praying with praise to God. And I believe that is reflected in how Jesus teaches us how to pray in the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. You know, last Sunday, I asked you to imagine, think, just said, think of prayer as, as if you were a peasant living in a land, a country that was ruled over by a king, and you wanted to talk to the king. You wanted an audience with him, and so you go to the palace, and you knock on the door, and you say, may I have an audience with the king? And the point I made was that the only way a peasant could ever hope to have an audience with the king would be for the prince, the king's son, to go with you into the palace and speak to the king and say, Father, I would like for you to hear this person here. He or she would like to talk to you, and they're very special to me, and I'm asking you to give them an audience. And only then would the king grant a peasant um, an audience with him. Now, take that same illustration this morning and imagine yourself there in the throne room and you are brought into the king's presence and introduced to him and the king looks at you and nods his head and says, speak. Let me ask you, what do you think would be the first words out of your mouth? when you got that opportunity to talk to the king? What do you think would be the first thing you would say? Well, unless you're willing to risk spending the rest of your days in the dungeon, I think that there are a couple of things you would not dare start off saying. You probably wouldn't start off saying, um, hey king, I got a problem, I want you to fix it. Or um, Mr. Highness, uh, I've got a list here of what I want you to do for me. That's not the way you start off talking with a king. You can talk to other people that way, but you don't begin addressing a king like that. that that's not, not the best words to come out of your mouth when you begin to talk to royalty, the sovereign ruler of the kingdom. 
There's a strict code of etiquette that you must follow when you address royalty. And in fact, the palace staff would probably coach you in how to address the king before you ever got into the throne room. You would probably want to start off saying something like, um, Your Highness, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. And you would, um, if you're really smart, you would start off praising the king, acknowledging his greatness, his authority, his power, and what he's done for the kingdom. You wouldn't just jump right in with your wish list or anything else for that matter. You would start off with praise. And I want you to think about this. If that is true for addressing a human king, imagine how much more true it is for when you address the king of kings, the Lord of the universe. The writers of the lay of the uh, Life Application Bible talk about that, and I'm going to read to you something they had to say about it. They said, the first line of this model prayer is a statement of praise and a commitment to hallow or honor God's holy name. We must enter the king's throne room respectfully. When we pray for God's name to be hallowed, we pray that this world will honor his name and we look forward to Christ's return when that will be a reality. I'm going to say more about that in a moment, but first of all, I want to point out just a few things about this first verse of the model prayer in Matthew chapter 9, verse 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I'm going to point out a few things. First of all, Addressing God as your father implies that you are a believer in Christ. That you're born again. That you are a Christian. It implies that when you say, my father. You know, I said last Sunday that addressing God as father is a privilege that God's people have not always had. Old Testament believers never addressed God as their father. Never did. You'll never find one example of that in the Old Testament. But Christ bring, brings Christians in, into such an intimate, personal relationship with the, uh, with the father that we have the privilege of calling him our father. It's a great privilege that we can easily take for granted and that not all of God's people have enjoyed throughout the uh, throughout the years. But even now, on this side of the cross, that privilege is reserved only for those who have put saving faith in Christ and been born again. God is not every person's father. Now, we hear out in the culture about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, and we're all God's children, but that's the culture, and that's not what God's word tells us. In John chapter 8, Jesus is confronted by a group of people who are out to kill him. They've resolved to kill him, John says. Yet, they insist that they are God's children, only by virtue of the fact that they're Jewish. We're Jews, and therefore we're God's children. And um, they, though, are obviously unbelievers by how they behave toward Christ. And, they, and, and Christ says to them in, in um, verses 42 to 44 of John chapter 8, he says this, If God were your father, you would love me. I came from God, and now I am here. And then down in verse 44, he tells them, you belong to your father, the devil. Um, Jesus divides the whole world into just two groups of people. Despite all the races, all the ethnicities, all the nationalities and religions, and everything else that divides people up into groups and categories today, the Bible t tells us that there, when you boil it down to the most basic truth, there are only two groups of people in the world, the children of God 
who have put saving faith in Christ and repented of their sin and thus been adopted into God's family. There's that group, and then there are the children of the devil, everyone who hasn't repented and turned to Christ and put faith in God. There's just those two groups. That's it, the children of God and the children of the devil. And the point here with regard to the model prayer and how we're to pray is that only members of God's family, who, those who've been saved, have the privilege of addressing God as Father. Here's another point to make about Matthew 6, 9. Prayer assumes that God is all-powerful and sovereign and thus able to answer your prayer. Remember, Jesus started off, our Father in heaven, or who art in heaven, if you're reading the Lord's Prayer from the King James Version. God occupies the highest seat in the universe. He's on the throne as God. And so think about it like this. Why do you go to God in prayer at all? Why do you make God your go-to person when you are in need? It's because you know that all the answers and all the hope and all the truth is found in him. That's why you go to him in prayer. All prayer is rooted in the conviction that God is all-powerful and that he is sovereign, which means that he is in control of everything everywhere, and that he is therefore able to change things. You know, if you don't believe that about God, then prayer really doesn't make much sense, does it? Why go to God if you don't believe that's true of him? But Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2 says, Where does my help come from? Where do I go to when I have needs? Who do I know that can meet my needs? He says, My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's the conviction that drives all prayer. If I'm going to get any help, any real help that's going to make a difference, I'm going to find that help in God. That's the conviction that is the basis of all prayer. And then one more observation about Matthew 6, verse 9, is that beginning prayer with praise establishes the proper order of your desires, which should be God's glory first, then, after that, your needs met. When you start out in prayer with praise, you clarify up front that, God, I have some needs, I have some requests that I'm about to bring to you, but I want to say right at the beginning that more than anything else, I want you to be glorified. I want you to be honored. I want your will to be done in the world. And everything I have to ask you is secondary to that. That's one of the things that beginning prayer with praise sort of nails down right at the beginning. On the other hand, if we just plunge right into asking God for things when we pray, if we bypass praise and go straight to, hey, here's what I need, God, then it's pretty obvious that our needs are what are most important, not God's glory. We begin prayer with praise to God because God frankly, deserves it. He deserves us, uh, deserves that we praise him. He is infinitely deserving of that. You know, King David uh, wrote a lot of the Psalms, and we know where to find them in the Bible, the book of Psalms, but some of David's Psalms are found in the Old Testament in other books, but not in the book of Psalms. For example, in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, You'll find one of David's psalms printed there, and uh, he says in that psalm, he says, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. And here it is. He says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. So God has glory that is due him, that he deserves to receive. 
There's nothing more important than giving God the glory that is due his name, that he deserves to receive from us. So those are just some quick observations about the first verse of the Lord's Prayer. Now I want us to think a little more deeply about that that statement he makes in the first verse of the prayer, hallowed be your name. What is that really all about? What, what further truth can we draw out of the scriptures on that? Um, you probably read the Lord's Prayer in the Bible or heard it read, recited it, whatever, many times before, but maybe you never really thought much about that word hallowed or what that's all about. Well, let's talk about that for just a moment. Make a note of this, first of all. Hallowed, as we said a moment ago, basically means holy. And it is a request for God to be honored. I was thinking as we sang <clears throat> one of the songs today, there's a line in there that really reflects the point of the word hallowed. It was, uh, make this a place where your glory dwells. And really, Jesus meant, make this whole world a place where your glory dwells. Hallowed be your name. And you know, we're coming up this month at the end of this month on a holiday that oddly enough actually gets its name from the word hallowed what holiday is that halloween i mean who'd have thought um a holiday that you definitely would not associate with the holiness of god but that way back in the past the catholic church many many years ago hundreds of years ago they had a holiday and by the way, holiday means what? Holy day. That's how the word holiday got started. It got kind of translated and changed into holiday, but it started out to meaning holy day. And the Catholic Church had a holiday called All Saints Day. And All Saints Day fell on November 1st. And the day before All Saints Day which would be what? October 31st, came to be, to be known as All Hallows Eve, the evening before the holy day. All Hallows Eve. And then over the time, that got smoothed out from All Hallows Eve to Halloween. And that's how we got the name Halloween. Of course, Halloween has moved very far away from anything holy. But that's where the name came from. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means holy. It means to be recognized as holy, revered as holy. And here's something else about that. It's not a statement of fact, like God, you're holy. But it's a request. Like we said in the song, make this a place where your holiness dwells, your glory dwells. A request for God to cause his name to be regarded over all the earth uh, as sacred and holy. Stuart Weber, who's a pastor, he wrote something about that. I want to read it to you. He said, we tend to take this line in Jesus' prayer as a statement of fact, when in fact it is a request. Jesus was not teaching us to make the request, Lord, may your name be sanct or, excuse me, Jesus was teaching us to make the request, Lord, may your name be sanctified. And then some other authors wrote, I've got this on your note sheet, effective and powerful prayer begins with an all-consuming desire to see our God honored and respected for the, as the holy God he is. So, um, that said, though, what does all that have to do with how we pray and how prayer affects our lives? Well, it's just this. The connection is that if you start out your prayers with praise to God, if you start out all your praying with something like, Father, may people all over the earth revere your name as holy, well, then that implies that you want that to happen, right? Right? You want everyone in the world to respect God as the holy God that he is. And so that will trickle down into how you live your life. 
That's the point. You'll live in a way that promotes God's holiness by reflecting his holiness in your own life. Because otherwise, if you don't live that way, praying for God to uh, be treated as holy doesn't really make much sense. It's just hollow. It becomes just empty words. If your life doesn't line up with how you pray. Hallowed means holy, and it's a request for God to cause his name to be honored. All right, another thing to remember. Remember Jesus is using the Lord's Prayer to teach us how to pray, right? And he's teaching us to begin our prayer with praise to God. And here it is. Here's the next point. Prayer should begin with praise because God's glory is more important than anything else. There's nothing as important as the glory of God. God being glorified. Nothing as important as that. And I'll tell you personally, when I realized uh, that Jesus was teaching us in the Lord's Prayer to begin our prayers with praise, it confused me a little bit at first. Because here's how I was thinking at that point. I'd always thought up to that moment that I realized that, that, well, shouldn't we all start out confessing our sins? I mean, if if we've got unconfessed sins in our life... uh, the Bible says God won't hear you if you've got to unconfess sin in your life. Well, you need to get that out of the way. You need to confess sin and ask God's forgiveness before you say anything else. And so I was a little bit confused when I heard Christ here saying, no, start out with praise to God. And I said, well, what gives with that? But then I began to realize that even though I may have sins that I do need to confess and ask God's forgiveness for when I pray, I'm still speaking to God when I pray. And so I need to approach God with words of praise. You see, no matter what you come to God to pray about, the moment you begin your prayer, Dear Father, or My Father, that's when you enter into the throne room of the King. And you always, as we've already pointed out, begin addressing the king with words of praise. No matter what you intend to say to God in prayer, you still need to start out with praise. Because again, God's glory is more important than anything. God's glory is more important than you or me getting getting our sins forgiven. God's glory is more important than us even being saved. And God's glory is definitely more important than God meeting our needs. There's nothing, nothing as important as God receiving the glory due his name. Nothing. And so it makes sense to start out prayer praising Almighty God for who he is, no matter what you come to pray about. So begin doing that. Begin your prayer by doing that. Start off praising him because coming into the king's throne room, there's nothing as important as praise. Psalm 33 verse 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the peoples of the world revere him. And then one more thing about starting prayer with praise. Praising God as we begin our prayers should set the tone for everything we ask of him. It just sort of set the tone. What is it I'm going to be asking of God? Well, how I praise him will have a big part in determining what I ask of God. I mean, just think about it. When you begin prayer with praising God, Almighty God, lifting him up, praising him, praising him for his holiness and his goodness and his sovereignty over all the world and his power and his wisdom and on and on and on and on. That just has an effect on what you end up asking God for. Because it wouldn't make sense for you to come right behind all that praise and ask God for something that is going to detract from his glory. Or something he would not will for you to have. Something that would not be right. So it sets the tone for what you ask. 
ask of him. In John 14, verse 13, Jesus promised to hear our prayer when we pray in Jesus' name. Remember, we looked at that last Sunday. But listen to how he says it. Maybe we missed this part of that last week. I'm going to read it again. John 14, verse 13. And this is Jesus speaking. I will do whatever you ask in my name. What? so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. And so right there, Jesus sets a condition on what prayer requests he answers. He says, I'm only going to answer the prayer that requests something that will bring glory to God. And so if you don't, or if I don't, request something that brings glory to God, that prayer request is not going to get answered. So that the Son may bring glory to the Father, and that's because God's glory, again, is everything. It's the most important thing, and when we begin our prayers with praise to God, it sets the tone for everything else we ask of Him. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That is Jesus' way of teaching us to begin our prayers with praise to Almighty God. Because God is holy, and because we want him to be revered and respected and worshipped by every person on earth. As I quoted earlier, someone said, Effective and powerful prayer begins with an all-consuming desire to see our God honored and respected as the holy God he is. That's the bottom line of everything we've seen this morning. And so let me ask you, are you living a holy life? Are you living a life that reflects and promotes the holiness of God? Do others see God's holiness in how you live? And do you, be do you begin your prayers with praise to God because his holiness is more important than anything else, his glory. As I always say, if you want to speak to someone today about putting faith in Christ, if you've not been born again, or if you would like to talk about another spiritual need of some kind, maybe you've drifted away from the Father and commitment to Christ, you want to make that right and come back to commitment to him or whatever you need may be could be joining our church see me or see gary or andy we'll we always hang around down front right after the service we'd love to talk with you and um before we go we're going to sing a song in a little bit but um uh, there's never a great time in the service to put announcements but there is something coming up that uh, gary needs to tell us about so gary you come on up and talk to us and god bless you till we meet again So this coming Saturday is October the 24th, and uh, we, we need to schedule a church work day. And we do this every two years uh, when we need to spread mulch around the, the building and the facility and the grounds. And uh, we actually had it scheduled back in April, but we had to cancel due to everything shutting down. But we felt like it was a good time now to pull this back in and, uh, and do this. So we need your help Saturday at 8 o'clock. And uh, bring your shovels, your pitchforks, your rakes, your wheelbarrows, and your strong backs. And uh, there's always a great time for students if you're looking for those uh, uh, hours that you need to get in, those service hours, a great time. I'll be glad to sign off. I've done that for many, many years for a lot of our folks. And uh, adults, come, bring your stuff. We just have a great time of fellowship as we spread mulch together this coming Saturday at 8 a.m. So I hope to see you there. Mike Beard is our chairman of our building and grounds team, and he'll be leading the way. And... Uh, we'll just uh, take his lead on how, how we will do all that. We have 80 yards of mulch being delivered this week, and so we'll need to get that spread very quickly. I think we can do it in about two hours if we have enough help. So come out this Saturday for a great time, 8 o'clock.